gentlemen, it's Guitaro5000, and today I want to speak to you about uh, busking. So, what is busking? Why would I want to speak to you about busking? Well, um, I have been a busker for about like more than 10 years, and basically what that means is I have played streets and subways and all kinds of public places and accepted tips doing that. And uh, actually, let me turn this off real quick. Yeah. Actually, for the large, for um, for quite a, the majority of my of my early career, that's what I did for a living. Your boy was out there playing subways and streets and stuff for money, and I did that. I, I think for five years straight, that's like all the money that I I ever made. It was just doing that. So I'm gonna tell you today everything I know, everything I know about busking, just in case you want to do that too, or you just want to learn about a whole new culture, a whole new like subculture. Um, whole new way of living. So, I, but if I say it's new, that would be using the wrong word because this is one of the oldest professions ever. Yeah. Probably even older than the oldest profession ever. All right, cool. And I'm going to do this whole, this whole vlog, this whole uh, video while changing my strings. So, um, and this might be the first of many videos where I talk to you while changing my strings. There's a lot I can talk about while changing strings, and this is going to be one of them. And part of the reason why I am changing my strings um, on camera is so that when I'm doing my vlog and talking to you, I have no excuse um, for, to like turn the camera off or anything like that because I'm changing my strings, and you know if I edit it, it's going to be very obvious. So no editing here. It's going to be off the off the top. I did make a couple notes. Um, on the board there. So um, let's see here. We're going to talk about how to busk, how to make money playing on the street and or just in public places in general with no gig, no appointment, nothing like that. Um, we're going to talk about where to busk. Why? First of all, we'll talk about why you, sh why you should busk. I feel, like, I feel like every musician should busk. By the way, it's busk, B-U-S-K. It's like an old... Uh, old uh, uh, European word. Um, so yeah, this is, yeah, so we're gonna cover why you should busk, where you should, where you can busk, um, what you should play while busking, and all that stuff. And I have a lot of interesting stories for you as, you know, because I've been busking for like 10 years. So um, I, please, please take some notes and put them in the comment section. I'm not gonna have. I don't have a structure for this talk. So if you could find, if you could um, be of service to your fellow YouTube watchers and put some timestamps next to the topics that I'm talking about, um, that would be really, 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 really helpful. So you can say, you know, and at the 14th minute he talked about this, and the 15th minute talked about that. Um, I anticipate this video will probably be like 30 to 40 minutes long. Um, and when my strings are completely changed, that's when it's over. And if you have more questions, just go ahead and put them in the comment section and I'll gladly answer them in another video. So, why should you busk? I think you should busk because, well, for one thing, you could earn some money for playing. Um, and, I, you know, there are ways to make money from, from playing in many, many other ways, but, you know, there's really nothing between you and busking on the street. You can just do it anytime, any, just any place, and hopefully make some money out of it, um, which I think is a very, very, very good way to practice. I mean, imagine you have a rehearsal, and while you're rehearsing your own stuff, someone's paying you to rehearse. That's basically what the value of busking is, in my opinion. Um, that's one of the major values. The fact that you can rehearse and get paid for it, pretty much. Um, another thing is exposure. Yeah, you can expose your message, you can expose your music. If you wanna get more followers on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, you can just go out there and reach the people directly and just have them do whatever it is you say you want them to do. Um, let me see. Another thing is, uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Just more time with your instrument. Like you can find your sound. You can find what you want to sound like. You can find what you want to play. 
Um, and the, this, like, nothing beats that. I, I, honestly, honestly, in my, in, like, what I've been doing with, with busking, especially recently, now that I have a lot of gigs and I, I don't really rely on busking anymore, at least for the past few years, um, I always, I always uh, play music in front of an audience through busking before I record almost anything. So when I did that Post Malone Better Now video, uh, I, I busked with that and played that 30 times at least in one day. That's, that's another beauty about busking, especially if you busk in a place with a lot of foot traffic. You can literally play the same set over and over and over, and you can't do that at a venue. You can't. Um, at least not in front of the same people, unless you have people coming in and out. It just doesn't work like that. And with busking, you can constantly repeat your stuff. So that's why I call it like a paid rehearsal. And, uh, oh yeah, you could find out what kind of people like your stuff. What kind of age bracket or, or gender or, or, or sex or race. Like what, what kind of people are really digging your sound? When you, you will see trends, okay. You will see trends with the people that you busk for and say, you know what, Every, like, girls like my stuff or guys like my stuff. So basically you can find your audience uh, with busking. So, all right, so that's pretty much what I'm gonna say as far as why you should busk. busk. So where should you busk? Okay, so uh, many, many major cities have people who are busking, uh, especially New York. Um, some of the hot spots are New York, Boston, um, New Orleans. I busked all those places, by the way. I've done this um, in New York exclusively for like maybe seven years. Uh, and then last year I started traveling and that's when I started busking other places. So the main, the, main, the, main, uh, the main thing to think about when you're thinking about where you should busk is where are other people busking. If someone is busking somewhere, if, if many musicians are busking in a certain part of the city, then you know that that's the hot spot for busking. Rarely would you find um, a, a hot spot for busking or at least a good place to busk that hasn't been discovered yet. Actually, you know what, I'm gonna change that. Every undiscovered busking spot um, is waiting for you to discover it. Yeah. So, um, if you go, if you are, if you are in a city where there are other buskers, just ask them where you should go, and most likely they'll tell you. They're, in my experience, having busked in many different cities, buskers are like musicians in general are usually pretty nice people, and they'll help you out um, if you want to find out where you can do it. And. Uh, yeah, so make sure that you, that you also, especially if you, if you are busking in a place with a lot of other buskers, make sure you also uh, keep your distance away from other people who are busking. Ah, there we go. That will be very helpful to make sure you don't make any enemies. Very, very important point, don't make any enemies while busking because the more friends you have, the better. Um, I've been busking in New York for a long time and uh, I noticed that it's really, it's really helpful to have people who are buskers who like you, uh, especially when, like there, like, there are times where um, I used to be looking for a spot in New York City uh, in, in the subway, and um, there's someone who is playing at a place I want to play, and if, and if we're good friends, he might actually end early so that I could play. That's pretty nice, right? Um, so, let's see here. Where are my strings? Let me see. Um, that said, make sure that you are aware of the laws when you're, when you're busking because, um, especially, okay, be aware of the laws. Some places don't allow amplification. Some places, some countries don't even allow busking at all. Like it's illegal or at least like certain parts of the country. When I was in Germany, apparently, um, you know, where I was staying in Furt, busking is illegal. And I think I busked there, I might have busked there one time. I went to Nuremberg in Germany, and I believe busking in there is technically illegal too. Um, but I definitely did it there too. So there are some laws that are present, but not all of them are enforced. So just be aware of that. Um, in, in, in New York City, I got maybe six, okay, after 10 years of busking in New York City, I got probably four tickets. 
which all equal about, all together equal about $200. So it's, you know, and um, by, by the way, these tickets were for using an amplification device on a subway platform, which is technically, you're not, you're not allowed to do it. I wouldn't say it's illegal, but it's against the subway rules to use it. To use it. So out of the more, probably more than a thousand times I use it on the platform, you know, getting four tickets is like, obviously it's a rule that's not terribly enforced. Um, you'll find that if you are a busker, if you start busking, you'll find that most of the time, uh, if you are breaking a rule that's kind of minor, a, a cop will just tell you to stop doing it or, or move or leave or something like that. And if that's the case, it's probably better that you should just leave, you just do it. There are people who challenge the uh, police. In my opinion, um, it's not worth it only because, only because you don't want to make enemies who are police. There are some police officers who have told me to move, who are real Guitaro 5000 fans. Like, they watch the videos, they love the music, and all they want me to do at that particular point, when they see me in the subway, is they actually, they want me to keep playing, but their boss told them, hey, this is, this is Busker in the subway, he's using an amp, so make sure you go make a move. So, you know, when he comes up to me, he's like, man, I love your videos, I, you know, I, I watch your stuff all the time, you know, but I'm gonna have to ask you to move. I'm like, okay, I'll move, easy, easy. Um, I've seen a lot of people argue with the cops and, uh, you know, some like, okay, so when you, when you argue, okay, in, in New York City, when you argue with a cop about busking, um, you, you, you actually do have an argument if you're not using amplification device on a subway platform. Like if you're going solo, like totally acoustic, um, there's really no law against that unless you're like way, way, way too loud. You have drums or something like that. But there's no law. There's no law in New York City against like um, using like going totally acoustic on a subway platform. So if a cop stops you there, uh, you can tell them that. But you know, most most of those arguments don't end that well uh, because the cop just gets mad and then he writes you a ticket and you got to go fight the ticket. Just go, just go play somewhere else. Um, so as far as where to busk, the golden rule is ask other buskers. Go where other buskers have 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 gone. Um, if you do find a place that is good for busking and no one knows about it, just that'd be short lived. Eventually some people will find out and they say, oh, he's busking there, let me try it too. Eventually, eventually. So yeah, just letting you know that. Um, so I think I covered all I wanted to say about where to busk. Uh, let me see. Oh, so what, you sh what should you perform while busking? Well, it's really up to you, there's really no rules. By the way, um, speaking of rules, when I say busking, I don't mean like doing an outdoor gig. I think I would say a gig is when you have, is when you have a, an agreement with someone who has hired you to play. Whether, whether, yeah, like basically when I say hire, meaning they're paying you to play. If you're getting paid to play from someone else other than people giving you tips, in my opinion, that's not busking. So... Uh, but you can schedule, you, you can schedule an outdoor show um, or, you know, something in public where you're not getting paid, at least not by the person who booked you, but you're getting paid from the people who are tipping you. That's busking. So usually in those situations where you're getting, if you are like, like you're getting scheduled by the person who owns the property or some agency or something like that to do busking, Sometimes they do have some rules about what you can play or how loud you can play. But most of the time, it's really, 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 really completely up to you. Um, so just do anything, anything you want and just see what sticks. Now, if you're a musician, uh, you, you're probably going to get a lot of money doing cover music. So as a matter of fact, that's how I did it. Um, I, I, you know, I played some jams, and then I played some covers. I knew like two songs at the time that I started, and I noticed that every time I played those two songs, people paid me more money. So I'm like, okay, let me learn some. Let me let me let me learn a bunch of songs. And uh, ten years later, <laughs> probably seen this in my previous video, but ten years later, uh, now I have a whole menu of music. This is like 500 songs now. So. Yeah, and that was a really good bridge for me to start playing venues and parties and stuff. I could, I think just because I started busking and learning all these songs, 
Um, it, it just it just helped me to make a whole career in music. And now that I'm like really working on my original music, basically I'm financing the recording of my original music by playing covers. Um, I played whole wedding receptions by myself. And some of these, you know, some of these, like, uh, uh, some of these weddings, like, would I get paid to do it? Like, there's like nothing to laugh at, you know? So that goes back into why it's a bust. You can really, really build your set. You can really, really build an act like that. So you can play, you can play original music as well. Uh, if people like the sound, if people like the vibe, you know, they'll pay you. They'll, they'll definitely pay you for it. So, but you know, there are a lot of other factors. A lot of other factors as far as how much you make. It's not just about how good you are, for real. Because uh, I found that busking in the subway for all these years, I used to I used to think that when it was a holiday, it was a good it was a good day to come out and play. But I found that with my act and the way I sounded, I usually made a lot less money around holidays because I think in the first five years I used to just carry like a little Marshall stack amp on my hip, and there was just too much going on in the city around holidays for them to pay attention to that. It just wasn't enough noise, uh, I'll say. Um, now that I carry, so <laughs> here we go. So this is what I busk with now. All right. By the way, I have this phone in my pocket for audio. So that's why I'm trying to keep it from shaking. This is a JBL e Eon One Pro. Quite different from the hip amp you used to see me with. And I have taken this to, to New Orleans, to Boston, to Germany, to Czech, to not, 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 not Czech Republic, to Poland. And um, yeah, we'll see. We'll, 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 see if, we'll, we'll see what happens this time if I use it you know, during the holidays in New York City. We'll see what happens. All right. By the way, I have two of them. Uh, this one, this one, unfortunately, does not work anymore. <laughs> so I'll tell you quickly why that happened. Um, basically, it rained, and now this thing is dead. I'm gonna reach out to to, uh, to JBL and see if they can help me out with this. But as as far as right now, it does not work. That said, I wanted to also get to uh, equipment. So. You want to you want to make sure that you have a good battery powered speaker or amp in places where they allow you to use amps. Um, you can also use a car battery to power the, the speaker or amp that you do have that's not battery powered uh, originally. So you can go out to an auto shop and get yourself a nice I would say a deep cycle marine battery is a really good battery to use. Batteries, the only, only problem with having external batteries is that they're very heavy. But they'll last you longer than any battery-powered amp uh, that I've ever seen. This is the longest-lasting amp that I've ever seen in my life um, like for the quality that you get for, out, out of this. Maybe it's like six hours or something like that. Um, but, yeah. I originally stopped busking because... I got tired of not sounding like I want to sound like. And finding this is what made me change my mind. Because this is the first battery powered speaker I've ever seen that sounds this good. And I'm not saying that because I'm sponsored by them. I'm sponsored by Ovation, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Get yourself an Ovation guitar. <laughs> um, but yeah. So but good, a good battery powered amp will go you a long way. Uh, let's see here. Oh, so I wanted to talk about the difference between, wait, where, where were we? Am I, am I still on what to play? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before I, be, be, before I go on to like the different kinds of crowds and settings that you want to play in and how to gather. By the way, I want to talk about how to gather a crowd of people to watch you play. That's, really, that's going to be a really good topic. Um, but first, like what to actually play. So we said covers. We said original music. Um, but you know, what if you're not even a musical act? What if you're a dancer? What if you're a ventriloquist? Um, what if you're a poet or something like that? Um, not every kind of uh, act works every place. But I've, I have been quite surprised in, in, in the past. I've seen, I've seen a guy who is a contortionist 
And this is going to be a very important part of the next uh, segment, like how to gather a crowd. He doesn't play any songs. He doesn't, you know, recite any poetry. Uh, he doesn't, you know, use any puppets. But he knows how to fit himself into a box about, like, almost, let me see. I wouldn't say that. A box, let's see. A box about, like, this is my crate here. Maybe, like, this small. Actually, yeah, just about this small. And this is a full-grown man, by the way. This is not some, like, little tiny guy. A, uh, he's probably about this tall, a black dude with dreads, and he can fit. Now, how do you make money busking like that? Like, going into a box? Well, this is a very, very important section of this video. How to gather a crowd. Now, there's some, place, there's some places that you busk where you don't have to gather a crowd because the crowd is already there. Like, part of the reason why I prefer the subway platform over like the subway mezzanine. By the way, inside the New York City subway, there's a, there's a platform where the train comes, like where you, you actually stand on the platform and you wait for the train. The train comes in and you walk in. That's the subway platform. The, the mezzanine is usually a level above the platforms and, um, and all you see is like doors and hallways to get to the next platform. So you wouldn't see a train there. You'd have to go downstairs to see the train. Now, on the subway platform, that's where people are waiting for the train. But on the mezzanine, that's when people are walking to wherever train, you know, train they're going to. So there's no reason for anyone to hang out on the mezzanine. Uh, they just, that's all foot traffic. People do hang out on the platform because that's where they're waiting for the train. So in the situation where there's a platform, that's, wh that's where you don't have to build a crowd because there's a crowd already there. They're already there for a reason. They're waiting for the train. So, um, but on, on, on the mezzanine, though, um, if you don't know how to build a crowd, you will probably not ever get paid. Like, no one's going to stop if you don't know how to make them stop. So, this guy, who was a contortionist, um, knew how to make people stop. He was not in a mezzanine, by the way. He used to be in a park. So, technically, in a the park, there's a crowd there. But uh, Washington Square Park, there's a lot of things to do. So, there's mostly foot traffic. And there's some people sitting there. And kind of hanging out, but most people are just really, really scattered. Um, he would start by crossing his legs and like doing some kind of like meditation thing. And he had this like these these uh, he had this staff, and he would light these incenses and stuff like that. And he would like light some and put some out, light some and put some out. He had this really strange costume that showed a lot of his skin, but it was really, really interesting. And when you look at him, he looks like someone in a movie, like, you know, it's like some like some wizard or something like that. And it, it's, it's just visually interesting. And you're wondering why he's there and what he's doing. So people start people start to gather around him just to look at that thing that he's doing, but just, just to try to figure out why he's doing it and what he'll do next. He didn't announce there was going to be a show or anything like that, at least not in the beginning. And all of a sudden, you know, between I, I watched him for 20 minutes. And the crowd just built it and built it and built it. And then when he saw that the crowd was a satisfactory size, that's when he started the show. It was a mixture of comedy, um, storytelling, all that stuff. But he let people know that by the end of the show, he's going to fit and he's going to go inside that box. I knew this was going to happen. Let's see here. Yeah. There we go. He told people at the end of the show... He told, he told people by the end of the show he was going to go inside the box. So all his storytelling and all his you know, comedy and all the stuff that he was saying, people were waiting for the big finish. And before he went inside the box, he said something to the audience. He's like, um, I know that if I go inside this box right now, I know you, you, you guys are going to love it. You're going to clap and then you're going to leave. But I, I make my living through doing this busking thing, and I would support if you, I, I would appreciate if you would support by giving me your lovely donations. So he made sure that he collected from every single person he could see um, that would, that's willing to give before he did the final act. And then people who paid continued to watch and wait. Some people paid him like $5, $20, or something like that. And he, he must have gotten away with like at least four, $400 before he even did the final act.
And then when he went in there, people were, I was shocked. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. Um, and by the way, when he was doing his show, his like 30 minute like storytelling, comedy, all that stuff, the crowd continued to build. So um, I guess what I want to say about crowd building is that in my experience, if you are in a place with a lot of foot traffic or people are generally not stopping or not hanging out, not sitting down, you need, you need some sort of visual act for that to work. Um, and, and, you know, the, the more visual, the better. He came out with a costume. You know, he, he was doing something that, that sparked intrigue, like all that lighting, lighting, lighting um, instances and putting them out. And he had this staff. And it was just a crazy looking thing. Um, dancers know this. Dancers know this about the visual. Because I've seen dance crews who wouldn't start their act until there was a crowd. Obviously, you know, they can't be like dancing the whole time, you know, as they're trying to build a crowd because they'll get tired. So what they would do is um, they, they would announce a show. They would say, hey, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, showtime's coming up, showtime's coming up. And then you would just see them stretching and practicing and all that stuff. It's, it's a visual. It's like you're just curious to see what's going to happen next. Um, I seen a guy who played who played saxophone, and he, when he played on the mezzanine, where he needs a visual, he has these like these dancing statues and stuff like that. And people would just be, people would just be, you know, just curious. Like they would just be, it, 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 it's just entertaining to look at. So generally speaking, when people are walking, the reason, the only reason, like people who are in motion tend to want to stay in motion. So when you have a visual. Um, what I mean by visual is not just a costume. You got to give people something to look left and right for. So if they're already walking, you make them stop and all they have to see is what's right in front of them. It's not as interesting as when there's like a left and right action with their eyes. So that's why, um, that's why some people who, who perform as a solo in the subway would only perform on the platform. But if they're a duo, even if, it's, even if it's the same quality of music, if they're a duo, they would work well on the mezzanine where, where there's a lot of foot traffic. Because on the mezzanine, when you stop, you know, there's two people to look at. You look left and right. You look left and right. So um, bands do very, very, very well that way. There's this band called The Beatles, who plays strictly Beatles music. They used to have like 10 pieces to that band. Um, and uh, yeah, it was the, the crowds that they got at Times Square were insane, like hundreds of people. It was like to the point where they were just blocking, you know, this blocking traffic. Unfortunately, they had to downsize because, um, you know, at the end of the day, they just were not making enough money to split between all those 10 people. It was the biggest subway band I've ever seen in my life. Uh, so they downsized and, you know, changed their name and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, the, I, it was a whole lot of fun watching them because everyone was making their own sound and it's just like, Visually intensive. Yeah, so g crowd gathering means being visual. That's what, that's, that's what, that's what you have to do. Um, let's see here. Uh, what else is I got to talk about? Um, let's see, gather crowd. Let's see here. Inside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this is going to be a look into some interesting aspects of my busking career. But, okay, I, basically, I want to talk about this. I, I used to perform inside trades. Now, that's a whole different kind of venue than I, all the other ones that I talked about. And the ones that I talked about were mezzanine, subway platforms, parks. Um, just being outside, you know, just like on, like on the street, but playing inside the train was something I was just afraid to do for quite a long time because that was all the way illegal. Like it wasn't against the rules. It was technically illegal to play inside a New York city subway train, but I knew that the people who played inside the trains were making real money. Like imagine, you know, playing two to three songs and maybe getting a few tips during your two to three songs, uh, or maybe not, and the crowd dispersing and stuff like that, be, uh, um, versus playing one song inside of a subway car and collecting like 
and tips from at least 20 people. That's how good it was. You know, you play, you go, you, you go inside the train, you play your one song, maybe, maybe two songs if you're really generous, and you go around and you collect money. Um, and, but you can get arrested doing that. I, I, I knew people who did get arrested, but they kept coming back like, man, money's just too good. And uh, at, the, at, the, at, at the time that I tried this stuff for the first time, and I did try it, um, I was in college, and I was raising money for college, and it was just, you know, I, 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 needed, to spend, I needed to spend some time studying, I needed to spend some time in school, and, it, and I needed to spend time earning money to pay for college. So I was like, it's probably the most efficient thing if I played inside the train and, and I'll make sure I do it on a Saturday because if I get arrested on a Saturday, then, you know, maybe they'll release me before school on Monday, hopefully. So I did it every Saturday for like anywhere between six to 12 hours. I was making hundreds of dollars every day. And I'll bring these singles to the Bursar office at my school. I'll pay my tuition in singles. And they're like, are you some kind of stripper or something like that? Like, no, no, I, I just play in the subway. Um, but all that changed when one day, one day it happened. One day it happened. Uh, I was in the subway and, you know, everything was going great. I played my song, got a lot of money. And right before I exited the train, uh, these two guys in coats were like, hey, excuse me, can I see your ID? Uh, NYPD. They were, they, were, it, they were in plain clothes, so I couldn't really tell. Anyway, that was my first experience getting arrested by playing in the subway. Uh, fortunately, you know, it was just a procedure for them. They just wanted to get my fingerprints and stuff like that. I stayed in a, uh, I stayed in a cell for like, I don't know, four hours or something like that. And I got some push-ups done. And I was told that, um, that you know, I'm not going to be charged any money. Just go to court and they will, you know, they'll, they'll handle that. So I went to court and I got some sort of deal where if I don't do anything wrong within six months, then they'll just erase it and act like it never happened. So I stayed out of the subway. I stayed out of the subway car for six months, like playing inside the train. I stayed out of that for six months and I was busking on the platform again. And I'm just like, oh, this sucks. This sucks. Like I was making maybe a third or maybe a quarter of what I would make inside the train. I'm like, ah. Oh, I gotta wait for these six months. Gotta wait, gotta wait. And my mom told me never, even after six months, never go back inside the train car because I don't want, I don't want you to go to jail and you're gonna get a record and all the other stuff. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, I know, mom, I know. Anyway, seven months pass. And everyone who knew that I used to play inside the car is like, man, listen, man, six months already passed, man, just go on there and do it, man. I'm like, no, 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 no. And then seven and a half months passed. And I was like, you know what? I'm going in. So I get inside there and it's like the money just flying at me. I used to play the song Michael Jackson, Black or White. That's what I played almost every single time. Money is flying at me. And I think I did about four or maybe five train cars. And on the fifth train car, um, that's when I saw someone I recognize. He was like, uh, hey, uh, NYPD. I'm like, he's like, hey, didn't I, didn't I see you before? Didn't I arrest you before? Come here. So, same thing happened. He took my ID, um, got the cuffs on, but fortunately this time um, I only stayed with them for about 10 or 15 minutes. I got a ticket this time. And he's just like, okay, get out of here. So that was my experience playing inside the train car. And I have played inside the train car many times after that for a couple years. So, let me see here. But yeah, I, I always remember that story as like crazy. Like the fact that I got arrested by the same cop twice. <laughs> anyway, um, last thing I wanted to talk about was, oh yeah, an another, another very interesting story. Um, now, when I say, when I say res okay, I remember saying like respect other musicians who are playing or other performers who are playing. Don't play too close to anyone um, so that they don't get disturbed by your performance uh make friends out there in the subway most subway performers are really sorry not subway but most buskers are like really nice 
Uh, they'll give you help. They'll give you tips on where to play, what time to play, and stuff like that. They'll give you advice. But not everyone. Not everyone is a very polite, good person or respectful person. I've had people... Um, I've had people who've been very territorial and very, very aggressive. One, one particular spot I used to play, um, or at least I played there for a little bit of time and I eventually stopped playing there for this reason, is 34th Street in Herald Square on the subway mezzanine. Uh, that was right under Macy's and I think there was a mall there too. So there was so much money going through there. Like so many people who came out of shopping and all this other stuff and had so much money in their pocket. So if you wanted to make money, you're gonna make money at that spot. You gotta make money at that spot. Now there's a subway, there's a, an agency in New York City called Music Under New York, which schedules you at that spot. And many other spots in New York, they'll schedule you. They'll give you a schedule, and you have priority over that spot. And anyone who's there has to move. Uh, if they if you're scheduled there and they're playing there, uh, they have to move so you can play. Now, um, there's this, there are a couple of dance crews who were very, very, very territorial about that spot. Because think about it, like, they are dancers, they have limited amount of energy that they can put out. So they want to get the most amount of money for their dance. Um, so, and that was the place to do it. The only thing is, you couldn't schedule that spot if you were a dancer because... Uh, they weren't accept. As far as I know, they were not accepting dancers with music under New York. They were only accepting musical acts, and maybe they used to accept dancers a long, long time ago. But if you were a dancer, you wanted, you wanted to schedule a spot, you couldn't do it. So all you had to do was wait. If you were a dancer. All you had to do was just wait for no one to be there, um, and maybe you could dance for a little while until the next person is scheduled. Or you can do what these guys did, which is. Whenever someone's playing there, make them feel so scared and frightened that they want to leave. So just imagine you playing your instrument, you're having fun, you're making money, and there's like 10 guys, maybe five or 10 guys just looking at you like this, you know, being mean to you and stuff like that. Maybe even taking some of your money or like maybe like, you know, slapping you or something like that. It's the most uncomfortable situation to perform at. So eventually they started running musicians out of there like people didn't want to play there anymore even though it was so much money um you know they it was not the best place to play so so uh the, as a matter of fact i had two friends who were brothers who used to play there and uh i'll think of their name but yeah they actually got they actually got into an altercation with the dancers and they got beat up, they got jumped. And it was, a, it was really bad, like they actually had to go to the hospital. So that place earned a reputation for being an unsafe place to play because of the dancers. Now, I had a chance to play there and I took it. I scheduled one there and I knew about the whole dancer situation and I just tried my luck. I, it, was me, it was me and another singer and they were doing that thing. They were mean mugging me and all that stuff, and you know, trying to get trying to get me afraid to play there. And uh, and I and there was a point where they knew that you know they knew the time that my schedule was over and I had to leave. And they're trying to get me to leave earlier. And if it wasn't for my friend, her name was Elikey. I had done videos with her before. She was somehow able to get them to calm down, and they didn't attack. They didn't do anything like that. She just talked it out with them and eventually they just left us alone and they let us finish our set and we packed up and, and moved. Um, but, you know, I've heard of a lot of worse situations that didn't end up like that. As a matter of fact, those two guys who got beat up for not, for, for not leaving the spot, they actually continued to play there even after coming out of the hospital, but they hired a bodyguard. Can you imagine that? Like having to hire a bodyguard. You're not a celebrity or anything like that. You have to hire a bodyguard just to play there. And, he, and they told me that when they hired this, you know, six foot five, 300 pound bodybuilder looking bodyguard, uh, those dancers just left them alone. <laughs> That's one of many, 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 many stories that has happened to me as a busker. And I, I definitely think that that was, you know, 
uh, uh, busking exclusively for all those years was a great, great experience. And I will never, ever trade it for the world. And I still go busking. Like, whenever I want to record a new video um, or practice something or, like, write some music and test it out for people, I would go busking. And I'm going to continue to busk. As a matter of fact, uh, I did a sort of a soft world tour last year that included some busking, and I'm going to be busking this year as well. I'm, I'll be... My aim was to bust and play concerts in at least 10 countries, 2019. So stay tuned for that. And if you have any other questions about busking, let me know. Or any questions about anything, I'll be glad to be of assistance to you. And I think I changed all the strings on this guitar perfectly. I don't think I messed up any strings doing this. Yeah. Let's tune it up now. All right, so my mouth is dry. <laughs> I don't think I ever did a vlog this long. Thanks for listening. All right, let's see here. This one doesn't work. Um, by the way, if you ever own, yeah, make sure that when you have good equipment that you have fail safe for when it rains. When I was in Boston, it was completely out of warning, like no warning at all. It was a rainy sort of day, but it was completely clear. And all of a sudden cl clouds rushed in and rained on this thing. And now it doesn't work anymore. Actually, no, 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 no. Um, it rained on this and then, and then uh, it's, we started to have mechanical issues with this, but I still continue to use it for about actually several months. Yeah, so I, I got, I don't know how I got that story mixed up. I used it for several months after that incident in Boston. And what did it in, what really did it in was, um, did you see that video of me playing at the uh, Sheridan in Times Square? I think that day, which was only a few weeks ago, uh, yeah, it was just a rainy day and the cover that I had for it like, didn't, didn't work. So I actually got to the gig, was ready to play, turned it on, no sound. Like stuff happens, stuff happens. So. You know, that's why I have to buy the other one. But I'm going to turn it on right now just to show you that I really did do a good job changing these strings. Let's see here. How do you turn this on? Um. There we go. Thanks guys, have a great night, see you next time.